everybody, and welcome to another webinar about the Summer Library Program. And our theme is Oceans of Possibilities. And today I'm going to be talking about um, library programs for adults and seniors, basically library programs for adults of all ages. Um, my name is Shelley Ziegler, and I am a library consultant here at the Mississippi Library Commission. And I'd just like to give you a little, little agenda of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, I want to focus on, tell you a little bit about the importance of adult programming. Um, I'm sure all, all of you know about that, but I like to, I always like to talk about that. Um, and then I'm going to talk about just the, the whole theme a little bit. And then I'm going to go through and give you some ideas for programs and also some ways that you can adapt um, some programs that um, possibly were um, maybe teenish or maybe our family programs, but can be adapted into adult programs. And then I'm going to talk about some book suggestions that you can use for either a program or you can also use in book displays as well. So I always like to give people a little roadmap. That's always nice, I think. I like a little roadmap when I'm looking at a presentation or a webinar. So the importance of adult programming. So why are we, why do we do adult programming? Um, well, adult programming benefits adult, <laughs> obviously, but programming in general is for people of all ages. And um, when I looked at the U.S. Census Bureau's, their quick facts, which is where I got this information. Um, the Mississippi's population of people over the age of 18 in our state is, um, that would be 76.9%. And so why are we not focusing on these people? Um, I also recently read that 66% of library programming is geared towards kids and teens. I think programming for kids and teens is very important, um, but I also don't want us to leave out this essentially 77% of our population. Um, library programming is good for so many things. It does improve the quality of life and our general life satisfaction. It provides socialization, provides information. It provides continuing education and lifelong learning. Um, adults want that too. It's not just for those that are 18 and under. Um, I read somewhere once that in the retirement phase of life, this is um, sometimes known as the age of possibilities and the time that people generally start looking for meaning and purpose in their life. And what a beautiful time for libraries to step in and give people information and fun fun crafts and presenters and and just open up their lives to new information why it's it's a great time for us to um be that source of information so i just love that time to find meaning and purpose so um, I encourage you, if you don't do adult programming, at least to dip your toe in the water and, and do a little bit. Um, I think you'll be surprised at the number of people in your community that will respond. So that is, um, that's my spiel on adult programming. I could go on and on, but that's what I'm going to that's what I'm going to say for right now. Um, I just think it's okay to 
normalize aging and normalize people wanting to find out more and, and grow. So, all right. So the theme this year, um, as if you haven't already heard, is called Oceans of Possibilities. And um, everyone seems to be really excited about this theme for a number of reasons. Um, it's a theme that um, can be generalized to so many topics. Um, and I think it lends itself well to library programming. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that some of the like subtopics that you can incorporate um, into library programming within this really, really cool theme. So some of the things that you can um, look at and incorporate into library programming are, um, of course, sea-related activities, um, oceans, ocean legends and myths, which I think is just always interesting um, as a middle-aged adult myself, um, ships and pirates. And I put on here Poseidon slash Neptune because I'm going to talk a little bit later about Greek myths versus the Roman mythology because there is a difference. Um, diving and exploration and deep sea related activities, deep sea related um, exploration, just the whole um, deep sea information. Um, then you could also go into um, underwater. There's a whole nether world. Not that sounds a little bit like the Little Mermaid song, but there's there is there's a whole nother world of animals. So you've got I put whales on there just because that's the first thing that came to mind. But um, whales and ocean creatures. And so what is this other world underwater that? most of us don't ever get to see. And then um, really important are the environmental issues related to oceans, how we as humans, and this is very, this is a downer, but it's something that should be talked about a lot. We as humans are polluting our oceans and we're um, with our plastics and our garbage and we are basically putting a lot of creatures and animals in peril by um by what by what we do with our garbage and littering so not to not to be a downer but it's something that should be talked about so these are just a few things under the genre, under the theme of oceans of possibilities where you could go. So, and I think this is a really cute graphic here, this little oct octopus. That's cool. So, so now um, I'm going to go, if you're following the agenda, I'm going to go into program ideas and adaptations. As I said earlier, uh, adaptations, I'm going to tell you how you can um, adapt some programming that may look like it's geared towards um, teens, especially, and you can make that more of an adult program. And I'm going to take a drink. So the first one is cross stitch. Now I am not a cross stitcher myself, but it has become very popular again. And I have been tempted to give it a shot. Um, and I, so I think I'm a, I think I'm a good resource when it comes to um, things that adults would be interested in. Um, you know, I'm a, uh, middle, I'm a middle-aged adult, you know, in my late 40s, and so I kind of, I kind of gauge, like, if, if it's something that I think I might be interested in, then probably there's a lot of other adults my age who would also be interested in th these type of activities in your community. Um, I think this would be a great program. You could also incorporate 
needlepoint, which is very similar yet different from cross stitch. I'm told that needlepoint is a little easier than cross stitch, but it seems like I hear more about cross stitch lately than needlepoint. Um, and then embroidery, which I listen, I know nothing about these things, but um, I would be interested in taking a, a class for beginners, fairy beginners, um, from my local public library about cross stitch. Um, if it was a very simple, simple um, picture. Um, so this is something that you might want to look at. Um, you could um, get a very simple pattern. I don't think that the supplies would be super expensive or that, and that would throw, you know, your budget under the bus. Um, and you could also um, cap the number of people that you would have in your class as well. So, um, and that little whale there is just cute as can be. I think that might be a good a good one. No, I have a lot of friends my age who are doing cross stitch. So that that was actually what led me to include this and what has led me to think that maybe I might want to give it a shot. Anyway, another topic which has been popular for I don't forever ever since it happened is the um, is the Titanic and the sinking of the Titanic. Um, the Titanic is the, um, not, not only is it the most famous ship, but it is the most famous maritime disaster. And I think it would be cool to have a program where you not only focus on the ship itself and the disaster and why, why it um, sank, but you could also focus on the people that were on the ship as well, because there was, um, there were several very famous families on the ship, um, a few who, who survived and some that did not, and I think it would be really neat to have a trivia game. Um, if you have a movie license, you can have a screening of, there's various versions of, um, of the movies about the Titanic, as well as documentaries about the Titanic. And there's, um, since they were able to locate the actual Titanic where it sank on the seabed, um, and I don't remember the date that that happened, but um, they have created a lot of documentaries about that. And if you can find a local historian to come and speak about that, I think that would bring in a lot of people and be super interesting. Um, I could see that um, being something that would be not only a good adult program, but a good family program. So I'm when I talk about some of these programs from here on in my presentation, you might I, I might tell you which ones are going to be good adult programs, but also ones that are that you can incorporate into family programs, and that's a good thing because that can up your attendance, which um, which is always good. So. There you go. And then going from the Titanic, we're going to go into shipwrecks in general, which um, I'm not smiling because I'm like, oh yeah, shipwrecks are great. No, but they are interesting. And people are always interested in shipwrecks and how they happened and where they happened. And you can actually go on, um, I'm going to say, Wikipedia, which is not a horrible site. People think that you can't trust any information from Wikipedia, and that's not necessarily true. But you can go on Wikipedia, and they have a list of shipwrecks, and I, um, I think it goes back to the 1700s, and they list um, shipwrecks by date, by location where they happened, and also by year. Now, I also want to uh, warn you that when you get this information, 
to double check that that information is correct. And that would be in the footnotes on Wikipedia about where that information was collected. Um, so Wikipedia is a great resource. It's not something that you should be scared to use, but um, where I would always recommend that you look at where the information was collected from in the footnotes. Um, so that would be um, a way to find out about shipwrecks. Um, I always think it's cool to have a screening of a documentary. Um, I don't know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something that might be a stereotype, so please um, excuse me, but I feel like a lot of people as they get older, there might be younger people, they tend to really get into documentaries. Um, there's a lot of people my age who hate documentaries, but I just feel like um, documentaries really tend to be of interest to a lot of adults. Um, again, that's a stereotype, so please, 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 please excuse me for saying that, but um, they, documentaries and bringing in local historians who can speak on a topic tend to um, be great adult programs. Um, and then I did put on here um, one contact that you could try is the Gulf, Gulfport Historical Society um, because I know for a fact they have in information on shipwrecks that have occurred and occurred years ago locally. So um, that might be a resource for you depending on where you are in the state. So that's what I want to say about shipwrecks. Then I want, this is kind of my favorite, I don't know, because it's so crafty. And it might look like it's something just for kids or teens, but I don't think so. Because in a previous um, summer library program webinar, I think I talked about a gnome garden one time. And um, I did have a couple librarians tell me afterwards that they did it and that it was, it was popular. And it was very similar to this. And this is like a fun, easy program where there's not a lot of structure, all you have to really do is have these supplies and let people come and just like let their free thinking and their creative juices flow. So with this, and you, you could provide the um, colored box, some type of container or basket, or you could ask the people coming to bring their own container. Um, you could provide these like little fake plants, and these are things that you can get really inexpensive at um, a lot of really, you know, Dollar General, Family Tree, places like that. Um, even places like um, Target where they have their really, um, their like one, three, and five dollar stuff at the very front. They'll often have really cheapy things like this. Um, and then some type of ocean-like object. It doesn't have to be a mermaid garden. If somebody doesn't want to have a mermaid garden, they want to have a pirate garden. That can be fine too. Um, just so, somewhere where you can find um, like nautical type things to put in there. You could try um, Hobby Lobby or Michael's, those might be a little more expensive. Again, so this might be a program where you could um, cap the number of people that can attend. Um, I always love a program where you just provide the materials and then you just let people, you know, make what they want and there's no bad way to do it. There's no right or wrong. Um, I think a lot of people don't, especially adults, they don't get the chance to be creative like that very often in their lives. And that's why I think this would appeal to them. Um, and this is, like I said, looks like a kids or a teen program, but it e it's easily adapted into an adult program. Um, and one more thing I wanna say about this is that this could also be converted into a, a grab-and-go um, 
um, kit if you wanted to. Uh, you, you could just do it in a really mini version um, where you just provide them, you know, like a few rocks, like and then maybe one plant and one little nautical item and then like one little basket. So that's something that you could do also if you wanted to do a, a grab and go. I don't know. I can't help it that this is my little favorite thing here because I, I really want to do one. And then we have the water marbling painting. And this is similar to the mermaid garden in that there's no right or wrong way to do this. It's just fun. It doesn't require a whole lot of supplies. There are several ways to do this. There's, um, you can do it in many ways. Um, when I looked online about water marbling painting, you can use um, acrylic plaint, plaint, paint. You can do, you can use um, shaving cream. Um, and that's where you add, you add paint onto the shaving cream. Um, you can use oil and food color, and you can also use nail polish. So there are several different ways in order to create the marbling effect with the water. Um, so um, really you just have to go online and do, a, I don't usually say this, but a simple Google search. Um, this would be a great family program. Um, it would also be just a great adult program as well. Um, but I would also say be prepared because it also could be a very messy program. Um, so be sure to have your tables covered and be ready to be wiping up a lot of stuff. But I think, I think this would be really, really neat and fun. Um, and then not that I'm talking about teen programming, but this would be a good teen program as well. So this one kind of runs all the, all of them. Um, I just think this one's really neat. Um, and like I said, I don't think the supplies, there's really, it doesn't require a whole lot of supplies. And there are supplies that you could use over again in other programs as well. All right. This is a, this is one that's close to my heart. So it is about God and goddesses of the sea. So Greek mythology is typically the one that people know about for the most part. Um, I don't know why. And again, I'm, I'm generalizing, so I could be wrong. But when people think about like, gods and goddesses, they think about Zeus and Poseidon and Aphrodite and Athena. So those are all Greek gods and goddesses. Um, Roman mythology, um, which is very closely tied to Greek mythology, um, but it's not the same, but they did take... Um, they did take a little lead from Greek mythology. They, it is a little different. Um, there's even a subtype called Greco-Roman Greco mythology. Um, and this is something where you could have an expert come in and talk about the differences between, um, between the two and how they cross over. But for example, in Roman mythology, Zeus, like the same character of Zeus is called Jupiter. And Hera, who is Zeus's wife, is called Juno. And Poseidon is called Neptune. Um, and Aphrodite is called Venus. And so we've all have heard of Neptune and Venus, but maybe you didn't know that those were the Roman gods, not the Greek gods. So this would be a great, if you were to have a speaker, um, a great educational program. Um, and I think a lot of people are interested in, in gods and goddesses and Roman and Greek mythology. And they probably may not know that there is a difference. Um, 
And then I want to talk about the Clash of the Titans movie. And um, of course, this will you you could show the movie, and there are two versions of the movie. There's the good one, which was which was the original, which came out in 1981. Um, and then there's the one I haven't seen, which um, I don't know, came out 2000 something. Um, maybe it's good. Maybe I should watch it. But um, the the good one is the one that I just adored as a child. And I actually learned a lot from it. Um, but the um, picture on the bottom of the of the young man in the in the blue toga looking like thing that's um that's Calibus and he is the son of Thetis who is the queen of the sea so you have Poseidon um, the king of the sea and his counterpart Thetis and I hope I'm saying that correct um I remember when I was little um and I would watch Clash of the Titans, um, Calibus would scare the heck out of me. He was very, very scary. Um, I, I hadn't, I've not seen the new movie. Well, it's not new, but the 2000 whatever edition. But I saw a, a picture, I think, of, and I don't think they call him Calibus. I think they call him another name. I think they call him the Roman name. And he just doesn't look as scary. I don't know. Maybe one day I'll watch it. Um, anyway, so you could show one of those movies. Um, caveat, if you have a movie license to do so. Um, you could also um, have a, I really like this, a Jeopardy style game or, or a trivia game um, about people's knowledge of, of gods and goddesses. Um, that might be fun. And then, of course, I I've always talked about having someone come in and talk about the differences between Greek and Roman mythology. Um, I find that fascinating. I think a lot of a lot of people would. And then we come to step by step painting classes. These have been taught. I don't know if there is a if they're as popular now as they used to be, but they used to be super popular, and they used to have all these funky little names like, um, um, I don't know, like painting with a twist and they used to have something to do with wine, like wine and paint or I don't know, things like that. I used to go to several of them and what would it, what it would be like is like there would already be a painting done and then uh, an instructor would lead you through making that painting like step by step. And it always looked like kind of a complicated painting, but once you did it step by step, it was not hard. Um, this could be something that you could do with teens, but I think it might be um, a cool adult or family program. Um, this one doesn't include doesn't require a lot of supplies, but the supplies might be a little costly, especially the canvas. You don't have to get a huge canvas, but um, you would have the canvas and the acrylic paint. Um, so something that you might want to do to ensure that people show up and maybe to help cover your costs is you could require a pre-registration fee, a very small amount um, of like a $5 fee. And that would um, ensure that people come and that fee could help maybe cover some of your costs. And I don't think, I don't think, I'm, I'm never one to, to suggest um, asking money for programming, but if it's something as like a special program like this, I think that once in a while it's not terrible. Um, or you can even make it a smaller painting. They have these canvases that are like three by three that you can get and you can get, you could probably order a whole bunch of them and then that way you would have to um, require a fee 
But if you were going to do one of the larger canvases, then that, that could get a little pricey. Um, but if you have a crafty person on staff, um, which a lot of the libraries do, I've noticed, when I, especially when I see their displays, and I'm thinking that there's, there's a lot of people that are already crafty out there that are working in libraries. You could have them um, run this program and um, do a painting and then um, help people um, paint it step by step. So, and then again, at the end, no one's painting looks the same. People might choose to do different colors than the original painting. And there is no perfect painting. There's no right way to do it. You do it however you want. It's supposed to be fun. So um, that's just an idea, I thought. thought that would be kind of cool, especially for adults. Because um, I know I've, I've gone to several of these. And... Um, I mean, and they were, you know, they're not cheap. They were like $45, $50 a piece. So, um, okay. This is something that I think is really neat. It is called um, decoupage glass magnets. And it's, it could work for teens, but I think it could also work for adults and families. And I made some a long time ago, like 10 years ago when I was um, working in public libraries. And what you do, um, you need either magazines or um, for this summer theme, you could have some nautical scrap paper, um, scrapbook paper, excuse me. Um, you need some Mod Podge, um, preferably the matte Mod Podge, scissors. You can buy flat marbles. Um, they look, oops, they look like that. Well, this is one that's already done. But these flat marbles, you can buy those at any craft store, like a whole bag of them. Um, flat marbles, um, foam brushes, they're really cheap. Um, magnets you can buy actually as a, as a, like a big strip, like a big wound up strip of them, and you can cut them. Um, or you can buy the buttons. The buttons are a little more expensive. Um, I recommend the strips. Um, and then you buy this glue. It's called E6000 glue. You can get that at basically, you know, any um, crafty store. Um, so you, you cut out of the, either magazines or the scrapbook paper um, a picture, and then you glue it onto the back, the back of the magnet, and then you glue the magnet on there, um, and this has stayed on there, gosh, I can't get that on there, or I don't even know we cut it in a circle. You can also buy a circle punch if you, you know, had, had, you know, money, not that they're expensive, but if you wanted to, and, um, these things, you know, last a while. They don't hold up a lot of paper, but, you know, you can put any picture under there, really. So, um, I remember when I did this as a program 10 years, 10 or 11 years ago, a long time, um, we had people who made, like, I don't know, five, ten magnets, um, and they were really, really into it. So, this would just be another fun outlet. Um, I just, I think enough cannot be said to giving adults an outlet for creativity because they don't get it enough. So, unless they just happen to be crafty people, um, in their normal life. Okay, and then I threw this in here. It really has nothing to do with our theme, but and every time it's brought up, people seem to always say, oh, yeah, that's right. Or they say, oh, I didn't know anything about this. So the Mississippi State um, Extension Services, they do programming. So if you um, go to their website, um, you they have... Um, they have offices in, I think, just about every county, and they have, like, a rep for every county, and they'll do various programs on 
they're not going to, I don't think there's any oceany programs unless you are on the coast. But um, I just wanted to let you know about this as a resource for programming all year round. So, um, and I just, I put a couple on there um, because I thought those were really interesting about social media responsibility, um, you know, uh, being able to um, spot real news versus fake news. Um, and because that's so important. <laughs> and there's um, just so many more topics. Um, so I did put this on here, even though it doesn't technically jive with our theme. I always want people to remember to use their extension services and they don't charge a fee. So there you go. Okay, now I wanna talk about what people call take and makes or grab and goes, whatever you call it. And you can also, these could also be made into regular programs. They don't have to be um, grab and goes, but I thought they would be neat. Um, one is a captain's log, um, which is a simple do-it-yourself notebook. Um, super simple. You know, you take pieces of paper and then you can hole punch them and then thread, um, um, like um, twine, I should think of the word, twine through it and make it kind of like old timey, like a captain's log and you could have a cover and a back of it. Um, it's um, basically like a, like a notebook, but in the theme, it's a captain's log. Um, and you can make the cover and say, you know, you can print out something and put on it and say captain's log. I thought that was kind of neat. Um, Okay, and small canvas sea painting. So I was speaking earlier about making that step-by-step -step painting class, maybe using a smaller canvas. So you can buy these smaller canvases. I have some at home and I forgot to bring them, but they're a little bigger than a post-it note. So they're like three by three. So I think this is like two by two. So they're like three by three. And um, so you could have it, um, have the, the image kind of sketched on there and include little um, pots of paint. Like you could buy those little plastic containers and put, you know, portions of paint on there, in there. You don't have to put the whole container. And that way someone could have their own, um, they can make their own sea painting at home. Um, make your own sea crystals is what I call them, but they're bath salts. Um, and as a big lover of baths, I thought this would be neat. Um, so what you do is you take coarse sea salt, which is like that Himalayan sea salt that you see everywhere. So, and you can buy that in like a big bag. And you take baking soda, not baking powder, and all this can be found online, all these recipes. And then you add an any type scent of some essential oil, whatever you like, um, eucalyptus, lavender, you know, what, whatever you want. Um, and then if you want for fun, and it just makes it look pretty, um, some dried flowers. And um, that's it. Um, so you could put all these things in little baggies and let people combine their own and make their own sea crystals. Um, and then a treasure hunt around your community with a fun prize. Um, what I think would be neat would be if you had a treasure hunt where people um, had to go around your community and there was a hint of some place they had to like take a picture of and they um, maybe you had a Facebook group like a private Facebook group that they had to join and they would upload their photos onto that that would be neat that way you wouldn't have to go around 
hiding stuff in your community. Um, you could just have these places where they would have to go and take a, a certain photo and the first person to get all the photos wins. And, you know, it doesn't have to be some fabulous prize, but, you know, people just like to, people like the hunt. So I think that would be neat. So again, um, I think the sea salt, or I'm sorry, the, the, the sea salt, the sea crystals, the small canvas sea painting, the captain's log, those could all be um, programs if you wanted to. But they all, they also could be grab and goes, take and makes. Can't think of another word, but things like that. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about some books that will fit into this year's themes. And these books can be used for, you can use them for if you want to do book clubs, if you want to use them for displays, um, uh, if you want to do a book talk and you want to highlight some of these books, you could do that also. So the first one, because it has the most, the coolest cover ever, um, is part of the Jane Austen parody duo. I do believe there were only two. I don't, don't quote me. Um, Sense and Sensibility and Sea Monsters. This came out after Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Um, it's the same general story of the two of the sisters and Sense and Sensibility. It just happens to take place in kind of another world where it's there are some seafaring people and some sea monsters and it's kind of neat. So if you had it as a book club, you could compare and contrast with the original book. Um, if you had a movie license, you could view the film version. There's several versions of this film. There's, um, there's PBS versions that you might be easier to be able to show. Um, or you might want to just include this in a display, a really cool display. Um, so that's one. And then I have just a general books that are set in the ocean, but I kind of pick different ones. So this first one, The Glass Ocean, it is an historical fiction book. Um, I read this several years ago myself and um, I love historical fiction, so, uh, but it's about three women and their, their lives on this ship and how they intertwine and, um, and as always, it's all historical fiction books are, there's always a woman with her back to the, to the, to the reader. That trend has not stopped. Um, and then The Deep. This is kind of a cool book. I have not read this, but I read some good some good stuff about it. But um, it's about the Titanic and about how it might might have been haunted. Um, this is fiction, um, but it's kind of a creepy thriller mystery. So I think that would be that would be kind of cool to read. Um, and then this next one is actually a favorite of mine. I love the book. I love the movie. Um, it's a nonfiction book called The Perfect Storm. Um, it's about a huge storm, um, the Andrea Gale, that occurred in 1991. And it's about this small um, fishing town um, I can't remember this, the state, it was on the East Coast, and um, everyone on, on the Andrea Gale died, and it's, it's not only about the people that were on the Andrea Gale, but the whole fishing community and the people that knew them, and it talks a lot about the fishing industry. Um, it's just a really, really cool book, and it's so informative, um, and it's a great movie, which is rare. I mean, a lot of times, you know, the movie is never as good as the book. For me, 
my opinion. I thought they cast this well, and um, I just love it. So I had to include that. So you got historical fiction, you've got a thriller, mystery, then you've got a nonfiction. So and then I've included two books on, one's on cave diving and one's on cave rescue. Um, the cave diving one is by a woman. Um, she has written Jill Heinerth. She's written several books. She's written a children's book and then she's written a lot of several nonfiction books about cave diving in general. Um, but she is an amazing woman, amazing person. She was the first person to deep dive into an Antarctic iceberg. And she's also like received a lot of first. She's like the first person to and like go like the deepest, the first person to get this medal and this medal. I mean, she's an amazing, amazing person. Um, so this would be a cool book to find more about cave diving and get a firsthand experience. And it just seems as someone who's claustrophobic, it seems terrifying to me, but I bet it's so beautiful. Um, the Boys in the Cave. This is, um, this is a story about, true story, about them. There was a soccer team in Thailand and there was 12, 12 boys, 12 young, young boys. I think they were like nine to 15 or something like that. And their soccer coach, and he, um, after, after a game, they went into like a cave just to go exploring, and they didn't know, but this cave was really prone to flooding, and um, it flooded, and they were trapped in this cave for 18 days, and it was, um, this is not a spoiler, because like I said, this happened in 2018. Um, it was one of the largest um, cave rescues in history. So all the boys and the soccer coach were saved. But again, they were trapped there for 18 days. I just cannot imagine what that had been like. Um, the Thai Navy SEALs were involved. There was a Navy SEAL that died. Um, British divers came in to help. I mean, this was a huge, huge deal. Um, I have not read this book, but the more I talk about it, the more I wanna read it. They are, there has been a movie made about it and it's called 13 Lives because there are 12 boys and the soccer coach, so 13 people. And it is coming out, it was made by Ron Howard, and it will be coming out in November of this year. Um, so you might wanna, um, this would be a good, I think this would be a good book club book to read and discuss um, since there is a major motion picture um, about this coming out at the end of the year. So, okay, I'll stop talking about it. I'm just really interested in um, And then I had to include a classic, um, The Old Man in the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. I, um, I like Ernest Hemingway, but when I read this book when I was way, when I was like in the eighth grade, I hated it. But I feel like, and I have found I get older when I, and reading things as an adult that I read when I was younger, I have a totally different perspective. And maybe if I read this again, I wouldn't hate it. If I would actually understand some of it. It's a very short book. It's only 160 pages. It was written in 1952 and it won the 1954 Nobel Prize for literature. Um, it's a classic tale of a Cuban fisherman who's struggling in his battle with a giant marlin. Now, of course, in Ernest Hemingway style, that's just the gen, I mean, that's just what the general plot is, but we all know that there's more going on there. Um, 
and I think that when I read it in the eighth grade, I didn't get the the bigger meaning of everything about you know man versus animal um, or nature, as you would say it. Um, so you could this would be a good book club discussion also, um, and then or you could also bring in a speaker to talk about the old man in the sea. And there's also a really old movie. Um, I don't know, I don't know, I haven't seen it, but, and I think it's subtitled, which I love subtitles, but you know, you have to, I don't know, read your patrons to see if they would like that, but it might be cool to read it and then maybe next time watch the movie or have someone come in and talk about the symbolism and the importance of the old man in the sea or talk about Ernest Hemingway in general and maybe why he wrote this book. So, and that my friends is what I have for you today. I hope that I've given you some ideas and just opened up your brain to thinking about adult programming and how important it is and how adults also want to learn and want to expand their brains and they also want to have fun and be creative. If there are any questions about programming or programs that you're planning this summer and you would like to bounce ideas off me or talk about how you want to incorporate a program, I would love to help. Um, I would love to, you know, if you need my two cents, I would, I would, I would love to, to be of any assistance. So um, here's my phone number and my email and um, just let me know what I can do to help you. So um, I hope this was helpful and I hope you have a wonderful day.